And now, Jalen and Jacoby. Welcome to the Jalen Jacoby After Show presented by State Farm After watching these films i'm still reeling i feel like i teleported back that that time and was to watch michael jeffrey jordan just like I was kid when i was a teenager and when i was a young man jalen i was watching these games from home but you were up close and personal wearing the pacers uniform playing this very team this documentary is focused on what was your relationship with this team on the floor we played them 11 times. Overall, they were six and five. Each team won on its home floor, culminating in game seven of the Eastern Conference Finals. I got suspended one of those games because I took two steps off the bench, looked 75 feet down to the other bench, where future Hall of Famer Reggie Miller was tangled up amongst the players and their staff. So I was just trying to make sure our best player was good. And so I wasn't like on the marquee or anything. I was a bug on the windshield. It was MJ. It was Pip. It was Rodman, former bad boy, now joined the Bulls. As you see, it was Phil Jackson. Like they represented all of the greatest of the great things that happened on and off the floor. So to play against them and have a chance to beat them, and to be winning by double figures in game seven and come up short, man, would you look at life different if Michael Jordan had five rings and I had one? Would he still be the GOAT? I think he would still be the GOAT, but I think <laughs> your life would be dramatically different, and I would be concerned that you would not be right here with me <laughs> recapping this great documentary. And one of my favorite things about this is it really just teleported me back in time, and we all have such fond memories of this team and this player, but – there's certain things that, that this documentary does to fill in the gaps in those memories. And one thing that I found really interesting was his time in North Carolina. When they mentioned that shot, we all remem remember the big shot that he took with 17 seconds left, by mind the way. That's probably not a great time to take that shot. <laughs> they eventually won them. No, 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 no. Yes. But it was James Worthy who was the best player on that team. Michael Jordan was country. not the best player We're on that here. team. It's little things like that that this documentary reminds you of that the, the, the sort of the age and the time might have washed away from your memory. What did, what did this episode and these episodes bring back for you about that time? So I can give all of the best and most intelligent basketball points of all time. But I'm about to tell you why Michael Jordan, beyond points, rebounds, assists, beyond championship rings, and it started in college, why he's the number one brand ambassador of all time and the former player that's a majority owner and the GOAT to ever do it. Jacoby, when he got on the fast break and he did that cradle to the grave, he dropped that thing off in there uh, and flushed the toilet, that changed the game. Dog, you playing basketball with your tongue out? And you're doing something you could appreciate. How many kids you got? Three How many children. kids do you have? Three children. Okay. So, so, so imagine somebody doing that with a basketball. That's something everybody can relate to. That's so mainstream. It's uh, so ill. I and, absolutely and, loved it. And, 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 and like it was poetry in motion because, you know, the way he stretched out his legs, the power and the quickness and the explosiveness that he had. Like, that's kind of what stands out to me, how he just looked like he was faster and, 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 and more athletic than everybody. Jalen, he was. We really appreciate your insight. And now joining us, the man behind the documentary, the director of Jalen's Fab Five documentary as well, Jason Hare joins us on this program. Jason, my first question for you is, take yourself back to that very moment when you got the phone call and they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I know that we told you we were going to air this later in the summer, but how soon can we get this documentary to the people? It wasn't a, a, a precise moment. We had all been talking about it um, internally. And then people online started to talk about it. And then I, I was texting with Connor Shell, who runs content for all of ESPN, and all of us were kind of gauging whether or not we could get this thing out in time. 
And we knew that we had episodes one, two, three, and four done. It was just a question of when we could have the final six done in order to, to get the rollout to everybody on time. So, um, but we were, we were still working towards a mid May finish date. We're working as fast as we can. We have been for a while. So that was always the plan was to finish in mid May, but now we could actually start rolling it out sooner. Jason, we appreciate you joining the show. When this pandemic and the social distancing ends, I want to make sure you call your tailor because you're going to be standing on a lot of stages accepting mm -hmm. awards for this amazing. I thought you were knocking my shirt with this documentary. What was your first interaction like in doing Michael Jordan? Well, the first time meeting him might be a better story. So I'm sitting in this apartment here and it was like 6.30 and, and I was gonna run out to the gym and I get a call from Esty Portnoy, who is Michael's manager. And she said, hey, um, and I had been talking to her for a year about this project because they were trying to get it off the ground and, and find distributors and a bunch of people who make more money than me were deciding how they were gonna roll this thing out, who was gonna be partners. So she said, can you make it up to Midtown in a half hour, um, Michael wants to have a drink. So I changed out of my clothes, rushed up there. And I was thinking the whole way up, like, what do you order? What's the first drink you order with Michael Jordan? Like, do you order? <laughs> so um, I told my brothers that night, it's like meeting Santa Claus. Like, you've heard of this person before. You've seen them in pictures. But it doesn't like they're not a real person. That's not a real thing. That's a statue. That's like if the Statue of Liberty like bent down and shook your hand. <laughs> there he is. And he, you know him. He's got that charisma and he immediately makes you feel welcome and relaxed. It wasn't until like 15 or 20 minutes in and we were talking. I said to him, why do you want to do this? And he said, I don't. <laughs> and I said, why not? And he said, because of all the misperceptions out there and there's a lot of footage in this thing that's really raw and he didn't want people to take it out of context. And we talked about how, you know, giving people context from the horse's mouth is actually the way to go to explain why you are the way you are. But then we started talking about, I said that there's a lot of misperceptions and somehow the Hall of Fame speech came up. I, I said, you know, like the Hall of Fame speech. I don't think people understood that. And he lean forward it was like it was in a movie because we're in this dark lounge and he leans forward and this light comes over his face and the glint of the light came off of his hoop earring <laughs> he with me like this and he said who's the only person who understood what i was talking about and he pointed his finger and his finger goes out like this for like a foot and a half and it <laughs> and that's the first moment i was like holy shit that's my <laughs> like oh my god <laughs> um but immediately he was like that the only person who understood that was Pat Riley. And I was trying to compliment people. And from the, from the, from the very get go, he was all in on, um, on answering any question that I had. So, um, and from there it was, it wasn't until over a year from then that we actually did our first interview on camera. Wow. I mean, I have a very important follow-up question that you did not answer. What, drink did you order when you sat down at the lounge with michael jeffrey jordan jameson on the rock <laughs> he, did, he did seem to be sipping something brown during the interview and there are some there was. problems a little bit of a continuity and problem. the ice was melted yeah where you see something going down a little bit it goes up a little bit how many refills did we have during that interview <laughs> i had nothing to do with craft services that day I focused on the interview Good answer. Well, and he had some unique cigars too, you know, long boy types. <laughs> yeah. He um he was taking a lot of heat about that off camera. Ahmad was 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 off camera, came to the shoot that day because they just came from the golf course to that first interview, and Ahmad was like, "You gotta give him a real cigar, or is he gonna use that for the whole time?" So correct. If you see Michael looking over his shoulder and kind of like smirking, it's at Ahmad. Well, I mean, first of all, I'm just I'm still reeling after watching just the very first episode of this 10 episode film. It, I'm just really it really teleported me back to that era with the music and the footage and the clothes. And one thing I was really curious about the decisions that you made was around the world. Nah, yeah, yeah. 
the whole chronology because obviously we're focused on that 97 98 season and after the first four minutes they've already won five titles and you're like, wow <laughs> this really is going to focus in on that one season and then we jump back to unc after they took the trick to france and you continue to sort of like use this back and forth style which is very well graphically represented how did you sort of attack this as not just the story of one season but the story of a team the story of his life and how you would present that to the audience chronolo chronologically well the the chronological spine of the whole series had to be 97 98 because that was the driving force behind why we were doing this is that they had this tre treasure trove of footage that no one had ever seen before it sat you know in a basement somewhere at the nba for 20 years so that was why we were doing this in the first place but with 10 hours there's only so much you can say about one season or one person so we knew we weren't going to spend 10 hours on just that it was going to be the story of the dynasty through the lens of that season um, those first four minutes or the first six minutes, I think it is that you referenced most of the world, they'll be seeing this on ESPN. They'll be seeing it on Netflix outside the U S and under a certain age demographic. They know who Michael Jordan is, of course, but they don't know the details of that team. They may not know that they right. won five titles before. So we had to give a quick primer to a new audience to say who these guys were why they were so important and how famous they were back then. But also the guys like you, Jacoby, who know that story, we had to scratch a little nostalgic itch, maybe play a little Biggie, a little Puffy, do something that keeps the people who know the story uh, entertained as well. So that was, a, the, episode one is a really tricky one to pull off because a lot of it people will be like, I know this, I know this. So the, the challenge was keep it interesting enough that it's entertaining to people who are experts, but also educate the people who don't know and keep them entertained as well. And also, he killed in college, made a big time shot in a championship game, played with James Worthy, future Hall of Famer that was a number one pick. Sam Perkins, big smooth, went number five, played for Dean Smith. And then he got to the league. And I appreciate the road trip when they were in the hotel and he went up and the teammates allowed him to come in. And he said he saw a lot of drugs that he'd never seen before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that seemed to be a turning point as it related to how he wanted to be a leader so very young in his NBA career. He said, you know, that I had to lead. I couldn't lead with my voice because I had no voice at that point. He was he was the third pick in the draft. No one at that point knew that he was going to become Michael Jordan. Everybody knew that he was maybe the most electric player in that draft. And he was a college player the year before, but no one knew what he was going to become. So he didn't have enough clout to sit to to. It wasn't so much leadership by certainly by vocal leadership. It was saying, I'm going to have nothing to do with this. And at that point, he didn't even drink alcohol. So he would literally hang out in his apartment um, all day long, watch movies. He had a pool table. He had a Pac-Man machine that he would invite people over to play. Didn't drink, didn't smoke, nothing, none of that. It was all basketball all the time. He was a gym rat. One thing this film is so good at is just filling in those little gaps in your memories because this did happen quite some time ago and you forget little things. And one of the sort of the, the, the thing that kind of gets washed away over the his, over sort of time and the history of your mind and what you pick and choose to remember is the relationship between this team and the front office and ownership. And very early in this film, you establish Krauss as – sort of someone who's at odds with the players and someone who was sort of at odds with Michael Jordan himself. And that must've been a very difficult thing to depict using those bites and knowing what you know about the story. How did you sort of approach that when it came to his character in this film? Well, if there was one person I could interview for this film and didn't, it would be Jerry Krause. Um, Jerry passed away four months before we started shooting. Um, but he obviously was at the center of that firestorm that created, um, the last dance scenario of that season. Um, so he's a polarizing figure and it's easy to cast him as the villain. I consider him more of a foil to Michael's hero because I think you have to give Jerry credit. And as you see later on in the series, when we, when we go deeper into it, you'll see him get more credit and be credited with being the architect of those teams. Uh, Jerry came after Michael Jordan, but everything you know about that Bulls dynasty besides Michael Jordan, was put in place from a managerial perspective by Jerry Krause and Jerry Reinsdorf. So we had to, I felt I owed it to Jerry to tread lightly and, and um, 
to involve him to have his voice in this doc as much as possible with archival footage. But we also had to depict accurately how much they villainized him in that locker room and what an object of ridicule he was and how much Jerry had to endure from these guys who were, you know, the cool kids. And they were going to pick on the guy who wanted to hang out with them all the time on the bus, which he literally did. Um, so it was, it was a delicate balance of um, giving Jerry some respect, but also telling the story in an accurate way. I really like how you did that because um, uniquely playing against those teams and then later being traded to the Bulls by Jerry Krause, rest in peace, having a chance to spend time with him. It was really unfortunate that he couldn't allow the credit to happen on the court. Mm -hmm. With Phil, it just so happened to be all-time greatness happening. He left and won five more. So that wasn't a good decision. The Bulls letting MJ go. He should be in ownership initially with Chicago. Shouldn't have had to go to Washington to even play. Same with Scotty taking victory laps for not paying them. And Reinsdorf allowed him to do that. So it's really unfortunate. Do, did they feel regretful that it seemed like he's the one person that destroyed the largest dynasty in the history of NBA basketball? I didn't sense any lingering resentment. I think that um, – in many respects, the ice has thawed over the years, which is one of many reasons why it's a good time to tell this story with enough distance and guys can be honest and, and, you know, conversations have been had, I'm sure behind closed doors for the last 20 years that has thawed that ice. Um, but at the time, certainly there was, there was a lot of resentment towards the front office and towards Jerry Krause's office in particular. You see Michael literally glance up and indicate that that's the most, that's, when he's asked by the press what's mm -hmm. going to be the most difficult part of the season, he looks up at Jerry's office. Great. So Jerry was definitely the scapegoat for a lot of the tension that was in that locker room. But Phil Jackson wanted credit too. Michael Jordan is not as, as vocal about deserving credit because it's, it's demonstrable when he's on the court that he deserves the credit for the Bulls dynasty. But there's a lot of people who had rightful claims to being the main reason why that team was what they were. But Jerry Krause, I mean, he gets booed at the end of episode one when he goes out to accept his fifth championship ring. Crazy, saw it that. It just seemed to be fun for the city of Chicago. Every story needs a hero and a villain. And he was a polarizing guy, and he certainly wasn't going to be cast as the hero to Michael's villain. So there was no place to go but down for Jerry, unfortunately. Well, you're watching the Jalen Jacoby After Show. We are presented by State Farm. And Jason, you mentioned this footage, this sort of unseen footage, this documented this one season. And I want to know what it's like for you as a filmmaker when you first get your hands on it. I imagine it's probably digitally. And you're kind of going through it. And you're seeing Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen and Phil Jackson and these sort of legends. And you're just being a fly on the wall. What was that first feeling? Like not even editing it, just getting your hands on it and seeing what kind of access you would have for this film. It was just a lot of wow moments when we were screening this stuff. We didn't even have an edit room yet. We were screening it in an office on our laptops. Um, but there's a certain mystique, and I think Jalen can speak to this too, about guys from that era because social media is so ubiquitous now. Everybody knows what a lot of these stars' backyards look like and kitchens look like. We know what the hallways and the locker rooms look like. We've seen these guys out of uniform, maybe more than in uniform. Back then, there wasn't that kind of access. And these, these kind of verite docs were not done back then. It credit Andy Thompson, who was Clay Thompson's uncle and Michael Thompson's brother, who works for the NBA, for having the idea to embed the crew. And credit Adam Silver for having the foresight to say, you know what? This is going to be a historic season. We need to document this for posterity. We'll do something with it someday. Well, now's that someday. And I think even watching Jordan Rodman on the on the lat pull down machine, something mundane, you look at it now and it's riveting because it's like I've never seen Dennis Rodman outside of uniform or in, or outside of a nightclub to see him in a different to see Michael pull up in his car, get out of his car and walk into a door. It sounds really mundane. And if you saw any of us doing it today, it would be boring. If you saw LeBron doing it today, it might not be exciting. 
But to see these guys off the court back then, it just felt like we had, you know, something that no one had ever seen before. It was palpable that we had something that people were going to love. So it was exciting to say, all right, how can we organize this in the most entertaining way possible? The next question I have for you is like, after watching this film, and now that you know, you've seen these episodes probably so much they make you sick because all you can see is the imperfection. But now you know that millions of people around the world have gotten to see it. It's finally out there in the world. Like you've burst- It's trending right now. It is trending. Millions of people right now have seen what you've obsessed over. Trending. Feel it. You can see it on social media. The response is insane. Number one trending everywhere. What is that feeling as a filmmaker, knowing that you've put so many years of work into this and now it's just out and done? At least episode one. It's very gratifying to, to finally have, I mean, our team, not just me, but our entire team for the last close to two and a half years has put their lives on hold to work nonstop on this doc. So to have it finally be out there is really exciting. It's really gratifying that people seem to be responding uh, in a largely positive way. It's also a bit odd because we're still not done with it. Um, literally, we're editing. I'm editing in my apartment today. Our editors are editing all over the city in their apartments. We're still putting this together. So um, just the same as it's kind of odd to, to shoot and edit at the same time, it's odd to be airing and editing at the same time. Um, but it's great. You know what? Especially now, it's a bleak time, man. Like, there's a dearth of programming out there obviously but there's also a dearth of connection mm. sports bring that connection so much whether you're sitting and and, and high-fiving the stranger next to you you've never met before at a game or whether you're interacting with people online or you see someone wearing a hat of your favorite team you give the guy a nod we're missing that kind of connection now and what better place to establish that connection than through sports and through everyone sharing experiencing this story again. So it's a privilege for us to um, to get it out there and to give people, I hope, just an hour or two of escape in an otherwise dark time. One well, thank Jason for joining us. We'll have him back later. We're going to shift our focus to episode two, much like the documentary shifted its focus from the season, 97, 98, with the Bulls and a little bit about Michael Jordan's background. But we learned a lot about Scottie Pippen of that Bulls team, not just about what he meant to the Bulls and what he was going through at the time during that season, but his upbringing in Arkansas, his draft onto the Bulls. Jalen, why is it so important that we know so much about Scottie Pippen to tell the story of Michael Jordan and these Bulls? Well, he was the greatest sidekick of all time. And, and as you alluded to, coming from a small college, he was underheralded in a lot of ways. People were surprised he went high as he did in the draft. You have to give Jerry Cross a lot of credit for understanding the potential that Scottie Pippen had. And as he ascended, that's when they went from being a Michael Jordan dominant scoring centric team to a squad that continued to move the basketball, play in the triangle. And while of course MJ was still going to be that dominant player, you need somebody else that was going to play at an all NBA level. If he was going to up in the Lakers, the Celtics and the Pistons. And initially when Scotty played against the bad boy Pistons and he caught his migraines, they weren't able to get past that squad. And as he matured and got a lot better, he became a, a game changer, a two-way player, a point forward, somebody that complimented not only MJ Will, but playing multiple positions, was really smart and versatile. So he was a guy that deserved all of the accolades that he got, and that's why he won the top 50 players to ever do it. So Jalen, one thing that episode two did that, again, like I, what I mentioned before is this is so good at sort of filling in the gaps in your memories of these teams. Because we always think about these two sets of three-peats. We think about this invincible team. But in the season that they're focused on in 1997, the Bulls did not start hot. Without Scottie Pippen, they really did not jump out of the gates. And you being on a competitive, a competitive team in the same conference, do you feel that perhaps this Bulls team – was beatable, that this Bulls team wasn't like the other Bulls teams before, and that this was going to be the year that the Pacers were going to beat the Bulls. Absolutely, because if you look back at who was coaching the All-Star game because their squad has the best record at that point of the season, that would be Larry Joe Burr, Rick Carlisle, and Dick Harder of the Indiana Pacers. So we were very conscious of not only their record, but trying to get home court advantage which ultimately ended up deciding our series 
as we played them so many times during that year. And unfortunately for Scotty, that season, other than winning the championships and all of the great accolades that he was able to achieve, it's still marred by the fact that teammates, since you signed the deal, can look at it like you were being selfish and sabotaging their year by not getting your surgery in the summer, but getting it at the beginning of the season. But then at the same time, you're a competitor. The, the organization is basically thumbing their nose at you, acknowledging that they're not going to readjust your contract. So it was a unique storm that he was put into. Uh, a lot of people would have handled it the way he did. And because of that, he doesn't get the love that I think he really deserves. But MJ never won a championship without Scottie Pippen. There's two sides to this. There's I've been underpaid. I've been underappreciated. I've been disrespected. I need a different contract. I'm not going to get surgery. I'm going to join my summer. And the other side is, well, you're obligated to the team. You made a commitment to your teammates. You made a commitment to the city. You made a commitment to the franchise. You signed a contract. You should obligate that contract. You always side with players. We've been doing this show for nine years. You always <laughs> side with players. But this one isn't so binary. It's not so cut and dry. So quickly, I just want to know, what do you think about Sky's decision to get the surgery at that point in the summer? Well, ultimately, when you sign the deal, you got to own it because you are cashing the checks. But this is unique, Jacoby, and here's why. How does management go into a year after a squad led by Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen and Phil Jackson basically tell them that Phil could go 82-0 and 0 and they're not bringing him back? Like, how, how do you say that to an individual? How do you look at Michael Jordan after the number five and feel like you're going to break up the team, you're going to trade Scottie Pippen in the offseason? Scottie asked for a trade. He didn't want to be there anymore. They were their most unhappy sixth championship winning team of all time, and it shouldn't be that way. Jalen, appreciate your perspective, but we'd like to welcome back in to the Jalen Jacoby After Show presented by State Farm, the director of The Last Dance, Jason Ayer. Jason. Man, trending all over the place. Jason Ayer, Bill Jackson, Michael Gosh. Jordan, all trending. Episode two. And one thing that you did, a decision that you made, which was, it was pretty bold, was that you said, you know what? I'm going to start episode two with the story, not of Michael Jordan, but of Scottie Pippen. What was behind that decision for this episode? As captivating as Michael is and as culturally significant as he is, you're not going to spend 10 hours watching a story about anybody. So we knew when we started this thing that we're going to tell the story of the Bulls dynasty through the lens of the 97, 98 season starring Michael Jordan. But just like there are other team or other players who made up that team, there's, there's other characters who make up this series. And Scotty is the Robin to Michael's Batman, as they said in the doc. Um, so it seemed like a good place to go. You know, we knew we wanted to do backstories about Dennis Rodman and about Phil Jackson and about Steve Kerr and about Scotty and, of course, Michael. So we had to look at the, series, the season as a whole and say, okay, when is there an opportunity during the season to tell this person's backstory? Well, Steve Kerr, for instance, had some huge shots that he made in the playoffs during the Eastern Conference Finals, Jalen, against your Pacers. Mm. That's episode nine of the doc. That seemed like the right time to go back and tell his story. Uh, Dennis Rodman, after Scotty returns from an injury in episode two, you'll see that Dennis Rodman goes off the deep end in episode three. Seems like the right time to tell his backstory. In episode four, Phil needs to bring Dennis Rodman back in and incorporate Scotty back into the locker room and still manage all of those egos. Seems like the right time to tell his story in episode four. So it was really dictated by what was going on in the season and the master list of characters that we had at the outset when we started telling the story. As a player and as a competitor, I just, it, it always pains me to understand that history truly isn't going to appreciate Scottie Pippen for the player that he was. I know he's top 50 and he has six championships, but he still gets dismissed as Robin in a lot of ways. Mm. And it's not only because he played alongside MJ, it's because a lot of these moments when he wasn't getting his money made him look selfish and he acted out on those things. Do you feel like MJ has some resentment towards Scotty when he did things like didn't get surgery after the season and waited until 
training camp basically started and did it on company time? I don't think there was lingering resentment that affected the performance of the team. I think that Michael was exasperated. And as he's plainly says, Scotty was being selfish. Um, he also said that Scotty thought he was going to force Jerry Reinsdorf's hand and Michael knew better than anybody. You're not going to force Jerry Reinsdorf's hand. So I think he kind of rolled his eyes. Michael lives in the present. Doesn't look back. Doesn't look forward to this day. But certainly back then it was like, okay, here's what's in front of us. Here's the hand we've been dealt. Scotty got that surgery late. There's no way of changing that. How are we going to move forward? How are we going to survive in the Eastern conference without him until he comes back in January? That was his mindset. He, it's impressive. There's a lot of things impressive about Michael, but his mental stamina and his mental fortitude to just say, I'm not going to concern myself with that because this is the situation in front of me. How do we best handle this now? That, as you know, Jalen, is as much of being a leader as performance on the floor. The, um, the focus on Scotty to begin the episode was really well done. And also because Scotty's story during this period in that one particular season, your focus on is sort of like a through thread to the beginning of that season. But Going back to Scotty's upbringing was interesting because we hadn't really seen that from Jordan yet. We had only seen sort of the, the University of North Carolina stuff in episode one. But in episode two, we went back even further. We got the sort of like the origin story of Batman to extend that metaphor a little bit too far. So, Jason, we all had seen the shot at North Carolina. We've seen the player of the year in college. We've seen the NBA stuff. But young Michael Jordan was still sort of an enigma even to people that obsess over him like us. Tell me a little bit more about this character of Larry Jordan, who used his brother, who used to beat him in the backyard. Because I want to know what happened to Larry. I got brothers. Tell Where's Larry. You? Rest in peace, Bill. I don't have a lot in common with Michael Jordan, but um, I was the youngest of three boys, and he was too. He's got two sisters as well. But um, and I did have a lot of. I was on the losing end of a lot of games in the backyard. Um, <laughs> It didn't forge me into the maniacal competitor it forged Michael into, but Larry was the best athlete early on in that family. And um, he had more in common with Michael's dad than Michael had with Michael's dad. And that was hard for Michael. So he did whatever he could to vie for his dad's attention. And he saw Larry as blocking that. And that was the roots of that competitive fire that you see even to this day was that before he even had a basketball in his hand in his life, he was competing with his brother. And he says, you know, he credits Larry with being the, the most ferocious competitor he's ever faced. And he said it made Larry and Magic and all those guys look easy compared to uh, Larry Bird and Magic and all those guys look easy. Uh, Larry now works for the Hornets, as does Ronnie, Michael's older brother. Um, but it's crazy when you look at the family picture of that family, it's it's. There's a dozen reasons why I think Michael might, might not be from this planet. And one of them is that when you see that family, they all look alike. I mean, Michael's definitely his parents' child, biologically. But that family, it goes 5'6", 5'8", 5'7", 5'8", 5'8", 6'6", 5'8", 5'2". Like, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. But they all look exactly alike. I mean, Larry is the picture of his father. Mm -hmm. Um so, yeah, they but to this day, there's still I mean, you can see there's there's still that same kind of brotherly sibling rivalry between them. So I'm glad you brought up a Larry. I want to talk about another one. His middle name is Joe. His last name is Bird. <laughs> and MJ. Late in the season, when nowadays teams are tanking for draft picks forced the team to basically play him after an injury, went to Carolina rehab. They brought him back, and he's playing seven minutes per half. Paxson makes a shot. Ultimately, a 30-win team makes it to the playoffs, play against the Celtics. This is his coming out party. How was it to discuss with him these games versus those Celtics? It was a dream for me because I'm from – Boston. I grew up a, a Celtics fan and um, and I was at the game that we're, we're about to discuss in a second with my dad. So and this was right around the time that Michael's posters were on my walls and my brothers and I were fighting over who gets which poster when we're at the poster store and um, who gets which T-shirt, who's going to wear which T-shirt. So it was a thrill to discuss that. I, I want to discuss a little bit, though. You mentioned Michael insisting on coming back 
uh, when management didn't want him to. Just think of the, the, the dichotomy between where the league went and, and where it was back then and where his head was. Scotty was going to get surgery late to punish the front office by costing them wins and costing them success in the short run. I don't think that Scotty was deliberately sabotaging the season, but this was his way of punishing the front office for this, his treatment. Michael's way of punishing the front office was to come back sooner and win more. <laughs> it would have been very easy for him to say, all right, I'll take the rest of the year off. I'll go down to UNC and rehab. I'm sure he would have liked to hang out with his family in Wilmington, his friends in Chapel Hill. He says, no, I want to come back and I want to make the playoffs to punish you. I said I'm going to make the playoffs every year. If we have a chance to do it, let's go. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, but, yeah, talking to Michael about those games, I was glad to see him light up because he understood, after all these years, the significance of that coming out party jailing, as you called it, um, against a Celtics team that some argue still is the best of all time. And, and I think anyone who knows the NBA would argue it's certainly in the top ten and probably the top five of all time. Obviously, we're talking about a 49-point game one loss in Boston and a 63-point game two loss in Boston. And Jalen and Jason were both discussing a, a, an anomaly in, in the box score from those games. Jalen, what exactly were you guys talking about? He didn't attempt a three-point shot. Just think about that. A perimeter player in today's game not attempting – a three-point shot, yet having 49 points against multiple Hall of Famers and arguably one of the greatest teams of all times, and then 63 in the next game. That's why Larry Bird called him Jesus in gym shoes. Mm -hmm. And also for a 23-year-old kid at that point, mm. against one of the best teams of mm. all time, to go into their floor at the Garden, 13 of 15 from the line in the first game. 30 win 19, team. 19 of 21 in a double overtime game in the second game from the line. You wouldn't see that today from some of the best foul shooters in the league, let alone a 23-year-old kid walking into Boston Garden after taking the entire year off with a broken foot. Well, I mean, one thing that's been a theme throughout these first two episodes is sort of like the different sources of Michael Jordan's greatness. A lot of that is his sort of motivation and perceived slights and his competitive nature how much do you think that playoff performance after the restrictions, the minute restrictions were lifted was sort of in a way, not just a coming out party to him and the rest of the league and the fans, but also sort of a look at the front office and the minute restrictions and saying, I could have been doing this the whole time. Look at what I do when you take the sort of the leash off of my performance. I think it was absolutely that. I think it was all right. Once, once you take that stopwatch out of your hand and you just put it on the side and you let me go and you release this, this, this cage wild animal onto the floor, this is what I can do. This is what I'm capable of doing. So put the right pieces around me so that we can actually win some games. Because if I'm capable of doing this and taking the best team on the planet at the moment to double overtime with no supporting cast, imagine what I could do if you put the right pieces around me. So it was clearly a message to them. Hmm. Jason, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the, putting the right pieces around him because also covered in this episode was – a very important trade, and that was a trade of Michael Jordan's close confidant and, frankly, protector on the floor, Charles Oakley. His bodyguard. The Knicks for, you know, his other pieces for basically Bill Cartwright, a center who was um, obviously much taller and a better rim protector and more of a traditional center in, in the league at that time. And Jerry Krause obviously engineered this, and it ended up being a trade that really helped that team get better. So – with Kraus being, the, as you mentioned in the previous episode, the villain to Michael Jordan's hero, do you feel like he deserves more credit for the moves that he made in terms of the roster building around Michael Jordan for the team's success? Yes, because Jerry Kraus loved Charles Oakley. He drafted Charles Oakley and was very proud of, of finding these kind of diamonds in the rough. Uh, and, and Charles Oakley was one of those. So he brought him to the team, and Charles was, um, Charles was the second best player, you could argue, when, when, at the advent of the Doug Collins era. But Jerry recognized back in those days, you needed a big man. You had to have someone in the middle who could actually be formidable against the other teams, especially in the East. Bill Cartwright, one of the teams in the East was, was the Knicks that they needed to go up against and Patrick Ewing. Bill Cartwright played alongside Patrick Ewing. Jerry was savvy enough to know that he played against Patrick Ewing every day in practice. And he would know how to defend him as well as anybody else in the league. So why not bring this guy in? We need a five. 
let's go get a veteran who can provide some leadership in the locker room and has a better insight into Patrick Ewing than anybody else on the planet. It was a savvy move. And I, and I also give Michael credit for this was one of his notes. We, we discussed off camera that, that Michael is an active notes giver in this in the best possible sense. He hasn't policed us once. He hasn't told me once. You cannot include that. You can't ask me this. You have to take this out. But he did say after watching a rough cut of episode two, you should add in that trade because that is one of the things that that turned that team around. And at the time, he's honest in our interview about resenting it because Charles was his enforcer, as Jalen said, on the floor and his best friend off the floor. But even Michael now will acknowledge that that was the right time to make that move and it needed to be made and it was the right move. You told us a story about your first meeting with Michael Jordan and sort of what you wore and what you what you drank and what he asked of you. And I just want to know more about the stuff we're not seeing. And what is it like working with him? And you mentioned he sends notes. Like, does he use grammar? Does he capitalize things? How's his spelling? How long are the notes? Does he send them through somebody? Are his pants still oversized? Yeah, just like, I just want to know all the details. When you see in your inbox, Michael Jordan, like how long are the emails? Do you click on them? What kind of notes does he It doesn't happen do? like that. It Has he appreciated like you? Have you gotten a present from him? Like, tell me more about what it's like to work with Michael Jordan. <laughs> so few of us have. He is somewhere high in a castle somewhere over a golf course somewhere in, in, in Florida right now. It doesn't happen like that. We get aggregated notes because there's so many partners here. We have Netflix executives who are the Michael Jordans of their business. We have... ESPN executives who are likewise, we have the NBA executives, NBA entertainment, and then NBA corporate and the Jordan brand. So there's a total of a little less than a few dozen people giving notes on every single episode. Um, and then there's one person who aggregates those notes and then communicates them to me and my team. So it's not like he, Michael's texting me and saying, take that out or, or walk it in the edit room and saying, who, what are we having for lunch today? It's not like that. You know, obviously he wields as much power as anybody. And if Michael says, I want this in, it's going to be in, but he hasn't exerted that power to the detriment of the documentary once. Like I said, like, it's crazy. I was, I was talking to our friend, Aaron Cohen last night and saying like, Hey, now, Steve, what up though? Now that he is, now that we're all quarantined, we're, it's kind of like the great equalizer here. We're all stuck inside. So he has more time to watch these rough cuts. And I was saying to Aaron that the notes he's giving are really good. They're really helping the episodes. Like it shouldn't surprise any of us that he's also the Michael Jordan of directing documentaries. The guy can do whatever. Oh, he wants. So um, I don't want people to get the, the sense that like he's censoring us and he's watching these cuts and he's saying, take that out. I mean, as the series goes on, you'll see that there's a lot of stuff that's not particularly flattering, but I give him credit for his candor and his honesty in, in putting it out there and telling the whole story. Well, as much as I'm interested in Michael Jordan in this documentary, Jalen Rose has one particular fascination with it, and he's obsessed with the soundtrack. So, Jalen, <laughs> I know you've been waiting to do this. Go ahead and talk to your boy, Jason, about some of the... Well, well I, I was listening to the tunes. I heard some May, some LL, some Rock Kim. Those are the glory days. So what went into the soundtrack for these 10 episodes? Well... You and I share an affinity in Jacoby as well for golden era hip hop. Yes. And, you know, it's not my fault that they played in the 80s and 90s. And if we're going to have accurate music sure. that chronologically uh, fits the time, then we have to use some 80s and 90s rap. So um, that was a really fun little side project for me because I'm such a, a student of that era of music and a lover of that genre. Um, so we tried our best to have every song be chronologically accurate. So if we're looking back to, you know, 86 is when I'm bad came out and Michael scored 63 points. Uh, like a muscle bound man and put his face in the sand. Exactly. Um, but we have, you know, throughout this thing, we try to be as accurate as we can. When, when we do the 92 season and their, their, their attempt to uh, have a, their first back-to-back -back title, you'll hear black sheep choice is yours. Cause that's from 92. When you uh, see their 93 going for their first three-peat that season, you'll hear some Naughty by Nature. So we try to do songs that are very accurate to, if not the year, then at least the era. But you're talking about um, already in episode one, we had Puffy, Mason, Biggie. We had Eric B. Episode two, we had LL. You're going to have Prince, Beastie Boys, Tribe Call Quest, um, Nas, Lauren Hill, Special Ed. 
uh, KRS one bars. It runs the gamut. And I, I give um, Rudy Chung and Justin Feldman at hit the ground running. That's the music supervising company that we're using. They're the guys who have been busting their asses to clear these songs because every time there's a sample in a song that counts as a writer. Mm. So for, for instance, we tried to clear wicked by ice cube, 48 writers, 48 writers. And you have to locate all 48 of these writers and get them to agree to a fee. And wow. imagine what that sliver looks like when you cut that pie into 48 pieces. So clearing music from that era, we all love that music, all of us on this show at least, but it's a music supervisor's nightmare because they have to do so much digging. It's not just one guy in a studio with his guitar, it's dozens of people all over the world. And some songs you can't clear, the, the, the labels won't do it. The original version of Welcome to the Terror Dome, they won't clear it. You can't there's, get that clear? There's so many samples in there, Jalen, that sometimes they don't know where it's from and they don't want someone coming out of the woodwork and suing them and saying, hey, that's my grandfather's saxophone note that played in there two minutes into the song. So some songs you just can't clear, but we did our best to, uh, to play some of the greatest hits, some of the less obvious stuff. There's some hits on there. You'll hear Fantastic Voyage later on in a certain moment. You'll hear some stuff that's radio friendly, but then you'll hear some deeper cuts as well. Well, Jalen and I particularly appreciate that part of this documentary, and we appreciate you joining us so much to recap this. Thank you so much, Jason. We look forward to talking to you again about episode three and episode four. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Stay safe. Jalen, I can't believe they allowed us, little old us, Jalen Jacoby, to host the after show of this groundbreaking, oh. guaranteed to be award-winning documentary okay. about the greatest of all time, Michael Jeffrey Jordan. I want to thank the people at ESPN that gave us the honor of hosting this. I want to thank Jason Hare for joining us. And I want to thank Michael Jordan for being brave enough to allow us to make this <laughs> documentary. I can't wait to return to this show. We'll be Time's back after every like episode chunk thing. drop. We'll be talking about three like and four my, next. Thank you so much for watching. Jalen Jacoby After Show, presented by State Farm.